Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so delighted to have you with us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the third quarter of 2012. And this particular series of lessons is based on the two small books in the New Testament, First and Second Thessalonians. Our focus for today is going to be on First Thessalonians 2, verse 13, through chapter 3, verse 13. So if you have a Bible handy, we would encourage you to open it. At the same time, we would like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with the word of prayer. Father, we recognize your presence among us. We recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in inspiring Paul and his friends to write these letters which have been so helpful down through the generations. And now give us at least mentally a connection with the original writer and his audience so that we can understand as well as we possibly can this far from their day what the message was and may we be able to present it to others as our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. First Thessalonians 2 verse 13. Let's, um, let's look at those first couple of verses just as a starter. First Thessalonians 2 starting with verse 13. And there's another reason why we always give thanks to God. When we brought you God's message, you heard it and accepted it, not as a message from human beings, but as God's message, which indeed it is. For God is at work in you who believe. Now that's an incredible thing to stop and think about it. I mentioned last week that this is almost certainly the first book of the New Testament to be written. And Paul has been in reverence of the Old Testament his entire life. And now he feels that because of the way God has related to him, he can sit down and write a letter to his Thessalonian friends and call it the Word of God. Would we dare do such a thing? Did he think that he was writing the equivalent of the book of Malachi and the book of Isaiah and so on? Did he think he was writing the Bible? I mean, it's hard to know that. It's, it's written like a letter. But he calls it the Word of God. But he was talking to a group of people that he had such love for. He says, I'm mm -hmm. bringing God to you. Mm -hmm. But he does that in the context of thanking God for that experience. Yeah. But Peterson puts it interestingly. And now we look back on all of this and thank God an artesian well of thanks. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, in this section of First Thessalonians, we see Paul pouring out his heart in prayer that his close friends in Thessalonica would not be discouraged and give up because of Paul's absence or even because of the persecution they were facing. I mean, here's, they've all of a sudden had this whirlwind has passed through and their thinking has changed upside down from what it was before. And now they're being persecuted and, and the whirlwind is gone. Well, how much a tendency would be there would there be for them to kind of slip back? Now before Paul came there was no church or was there a church? The, no, there was no church at all. So as far came, as we know. They came together. He came to the synagogue first, and then he went out and preached to the Gentiles. And he left a few weeks later. And I mean a very church. few weeks later, and he has a, a cohesive group. And we're going to learn that some of those people ended up being following Paul around and working with him. I mean, after that brief exposure. So, pretty awesome. Well, Paul reminded them that their friendship, even though it was established over such a short period of time, was supposed to last how long? Forever. Forever. There, he said, you know, where we are here right now, it might seem like a very temporary thing. I can assure you this friendship, if we remain faithful to God, is going to go on forever. Well, read down to verse 16. Let's just have a look at that. We read verse 13. I'm going to read 14 and on. Our brothers and sisters, the same things happened to you that happened to the churches of God, God in Judea, to the people there who belong to Christ Jesus. So what, what's he trying to say to them? 
he says the hassle that you've been through, mm -hmm. you're not the first one to go through it. Right, exactly. This is to be expected. I mean, the people at headquarters, this is what happened to them, right? You suffered the same persecutions from your own people that they suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. How displeasing they are to God. How hostile they are to everyone. <laughs> and who's he talking about? He's talking about the people who used to be his closest friends and associates. Because he was on the Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. They make themselves an offense to God and everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They even tried to stop us from preaching to the Gentiles the message that would bring salvation. In this way, they have brought to completion all the sins they have always committed. And now God's anger has at last come down on them. Wow. Paul was talking about himself before the Damascus Road mm -hmm. there. Yeah. People like himself. Yeah. What and does it mean God's anger has come down upon them? Well, let's, let's look a little bit at the background of the, what he's thinking about, and then let's try to answer that question. That's a very good question. What happened in, in Acts 6, do you remember? Remember that there was some complaining about whose widows were going to get what, and they chose seven deacons, right? And who was the number one deacon? Stephen. Stephen. And what happened? What did Stephen do? Got did he spend all his time, all his, all his time serving tables? And preaching. And preaching. And he went to the synagogue of the freedmen. Now, what's the synagogue of the freedmen? They were slaves and now they're free. Mm, yeah, um, <laughs> sort of, more or less. But that's not the real. There was a large synagogue, probably a number of synagogues. They, they estimate there have been, may have been three or four hundred synagogues in and around Jerusalem. We're not talking about the temple. We're talking about little places where pe people would get together, groups of people would get together and worship. But there was a fairly large synagogue of Greek-speaking Jews known as the synagogue of the freedmen. And Stephen would go there and his arguments were so compelling that nobody could answer him. And these Jews, you know, they were, here's, they're at headquarters, they're at Jerusalem, they're supposed to be stopping this kind of stuff. And so it wasn't too long before Stephen was arrested and taken before the Sanhedrin, where he gave that incredible sermon we find in Acts 7. And what was the result? Well, what we read in Acts, well, let's, just, let, let's start from uh, verse 57 of Acts 7. With a loud cry, the members of the council covered their ears with their hands. Then they all rushed at him at once, threw him out of the city, and stoned him. The witnesses left their cloaks, cloaks in the care of a young man named Saul. The witnesses left, I'm sorry, they kept on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord do not remember this sin against them. He said this and died. And Saul approved of his murder. So these people covered their ears and they didn't want to hear the truth. Yeah. It, it, it was piercing too deeply and they just yeah. wanted to get rid of it. That very day, it goes on to say in that first verse of chapter 8, that very day the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. Well, some devout men buried Stephen, mourning for him with loud cries. Pretty sad story. Well, no doubt when he entered Thessalonica with, covered with bruises and wounds, Paul knew that it was likely that this soon to be, that his soon to be Thessalonian friends might someday face a similar plight. plight. I mean, didn't he recognize that was a very good possibility? He reminded them of what happened in Jerusalem after the speech and stoning of Stephen. No doubt that experience was burned into the memory of Paul. If you had been a part of the stoning of Stephen, would it be easier for you to remain faithful during persecution? How would a, being a part of an experience like that impact you, do you think? Could you pick up stones and throw it at somebody with the intent of trying to kill them. 
but they saw how Stephen died and, and how he saw God and he didn't die like they mm -hmm. expected him to. So mm -hmm. that would be very memorial and impressive. That had to change some of them. How, how would you feel about, and this is, this is a current question, I hope, how would you feel about converting people to become Christians if you knew that very soon they would be persecuted like that? I think that they looked at that in that they were so enthralled with what Jesus had done for them mm -hmm. that to suffer for his cause, they'd say it's a privilege. It, it's a privilege. Why is it that, the famous statement is, why is it that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church? That kind of dedication, that kind of unanswerable logic, that unanswerable demonstration just has an effect on people. I mean, you can look at the world, take your choice. If you know anything about the history of the church, from Jesus' day to our day, if you look at the places where persecution is going on, that's the place where the church is growing the fastest. Why is that? You see, probably contrasts, and the, it generally it's an authority of a figure of some sort mm -hmm. that uh, says, hey, don't do this, and maybe the human mind inquires, don't do what and why? And mm -hmm. then they see the illogic of, of conforming and maybe choose to, uh, hopefully, many of, that's how the, the history shows they if, yeah. gave what, up on them. What you're saying, if I understand you, is if a person believes in something so compellingly that they're willing to die for it, you want to say, well, you know, what, what is it? What's going on in their head? What's going on in their head when he says, don't lay this sin against them? What's going on in his head? Well, that's what Jesus said. I know that's what Jesus said. I'm still trying to understand it. <laughs> you know, but in America, do we have that in us? You have to love the truth. Um, we're, do, the, uh, do we take the easy way out and develop our faith as to what is popular so that we can thrive with all our material goods and stuff? I mean, is that something that's fading in today's world, the ability to stand up to what you believe is truth? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Paul knew when he traveled from Philippi to Thessalonica, I'm sure he understood that it would not be long before word would get back from Thessalon Thessalonica to, to Philippi. And he probably suspected what would happen next. He knew that there were people following him around. I mean, this isn't, Paul has been stoned himself back on his first missionary journey, back, back in Lystra, wasn't he? There were people following him around the Mediterranean world trying to undo everything he had done. What, what motivated those people who were following Paul around trying to undo his work? And who, who, who paid them to do that? Did, was someone paying them to do that? We sort of have the same going on in our political um, debate. Uh, ads are following the candidates around trying to undo everything they they stand for <laughs> and so they're being followed and haunted and um, what motivates them uh, people want things um, their own way and they don't want the world to change regardless if it's right or wrong mm -hmm. uh, maybe the Jewish people they wanted uh, their religion to be the main religion and to continue they didn't want anything to do with these new Christians it was a, like a... Um, well, the logic they used with Jesus is if, if all these people start following him, there'll be a, an insurrection and the Romans will come down and take our temple, they'll take all of us and we'll lose everything. Mm -hmm. So we got to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Although it, were, it was people doing all this thing, uh, but we're not fighting each other, though we think we are. It is beyond that. We're fighting against, against principalities and 
you know, we're fighting even against the devil in himself. Mm -hmm. So those people are doing the work of their father, the devil. Yes. <laughs> yes. They are doing what they're doing. Yeah. Well, Paul is not, th this is not an a, a, a ethnic prejudice he's talking about here. Paul is not opposed to Jews. He was a Jew himself. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And all the early apostles were Jews, right? And, you know, many, much of the early church were, were Jewish. Jesus was a Jew. So we need to remember that every person alive on planet Earth is a son or a daughter of God for whom he would have been willing to die if that were the only person in the entire world that believed in him. Every single one of them. If we truly recognize that, would it change the way we witness? Say that again. If we recognize that each person that we have a chance to witness to is a son or daughter of God, for whom Christ would have died if that person were the only one that would be saved, would that change the way we witness? Or would that motivate us to witness? Well, that <laughs> might change our witness, right? Does it affect how we treat other people? Yeah, and sure does. If we believe that, how, how would it affect racial prejudices, ethnic, ethnic, ethnic differences? They go out the window. There's no place for it. Well, Paul goes on, 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 and following. As for us, brothers and sisters, when we were separated you from you for a little while, now remember, he's forced to go to Berea, and then they, they realize what had happened in Philippi and Thessalonica, so the brethren said, you know what? Before things get hot in Berea here, you better leave and go somewhere else. So they hustled Paul out of Berea and down to Athens, okay? So Paul says, we were separated you for, from you for a little while, not in our thoughts, of course, but only in body. How we missed you and how hard we tried to see you again. We wanted to return to you. I myself tried to go back more than once, but Satan would not let us. Oh, boy. <laughs> What's going on here? Satan stymied us each time. <laughs> Satan stymied us each time. Circumstance after circumstance after circumstance prevented them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes does that happen to us when we want to do something? This will get in the way. I mean, it's, I always think life is jumping barrels. Mm -hmm. This will get in the way. That will get in the way. Okay. You think Satan really was behind that? Or was it Paul just saying, well, things aren't going so well. It must be Satan doing something. Oh, that was Satan tracking him down moment by moment, day by day, person by person. And how would Satan make life difficult for Paul? Any way he could. <laughs> Any way he could. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he would use the people that listened to him to then work with Paul. So Paul goes on, verse 19, After all, it is you, you no less than others, who are our hope, our joy and our reason for boasting of our victory in the presence of the Lord Jesus when he comes. Indeed, you are our pride and our joy. You think that when we get to heaven and someone comes up to us and says, you know, you had a, uh, you had a part in convincing me of the truth. Would we dare to say, come with me? We'll go up to Jesus and say, you know what? I just helped this, this person to come to the king. And what do you think about that? And it'd be the other way around. The person is saying, this one helped me. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. That's probably what well, would happen. Well, also, we may present something to someone, but it has to be God's Holy Spirit that's working with that person to make them recognize that what we're presenting has some merit. Yeah. Don't you think? Now, Paul is writing this book, this short letter, in response to Timothy's coming back. He sent Timothy up to, to Thessalonica and said, you've got to go back there and see how they're doing. And Timothy comes back and says, okay, now, this is what's going on. Paul says, I've got to write a letter. I just have to write a letter. So he writes this letter. He recognized that there's a, there were some problems. What were some of the problems that he was concerned about? We're going to talk about these a lot more later, but just to sort of set the stage, what, what, what was he concerned about? Remember? 
He's going to focus on it in chapters 4 and 5. We haven't got there yet. His focus is about getting ready for the imminent come of Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. And he's trying to convince these people, hey, and their, their, their response was, well, you know, some, some of our friends are actually dying. Now, we don't know if these friends died in the persecution or they died of natural causes, what exactly happened, or whether they may be even talking about people who had died previously that they thought were, were good saints, you know, but maybe hadn't heard the gospel. And Paul says, don't let that worry you, you know, and he's going to talk about the resurrection. He's going to talk about the second coming of Jesus in chapter 4, which we'll be into next week, probably. There are not many verses in the Bible that speak specifically about Satan's activity. But here's one. Paul wanted the Thessalonians to understand that he still felt about them as if he were an orphan child torn away from his parents. Now he talked about being a father and a mother to them. Now he's talking about being like a, I'm like an orphan child. I've been orphaned. From, literally, the Greek is orphaned. I have been orphaned from you. Paul was a rather emotional man. He, he, he had strong feelings. Remember when he, in Galatians he said, even if an angel from heaven tries to preach a different message than the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. Well, actually, my good news Bible says, may he be condemned to hell. Wow. We're in modern idiom, to hell with him. Yeah, <laughs> right. Mm. <laughs> well, how did Paul feel about all this? He was not discouraged. He had no intention of giving up. He had a longer range view, or what we sometimes call a larger view, of the issues in the great controversy. He expected someday fairly soon after that, I, I think he would be shocked if we told him we're still here 2,000 years later. He expected someday fairly soon after that to meet his Thessalonian friends in the kingdom of heaven, even perhaps having an opportunity to boast about them to Jesus himself. And like you, know, you said, Norm, the Thessalonians would probably be boasting about Paul. Yeah. That's what Christians need. They need a longer view that lets other things fit into it and, and like more pulls you through. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have an overall, um, like for when you do any project, you should have an overall view of the project and then you don't get lost in the trees. Mm -hmm. So uh, Paul had a very strong overview. Yeah. Which is what is attractive about the Adventist church too. There's a very big overview. And that's of course based on our founding mother, Ellen White, and her great controversy series. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And and it's documented in the Bible. Yeah. It's just not. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. I have a question. If Paul used use such expediency to talk about Jesus, and if we believe it's because he thought the coming of Christ was so eminent. Uh, do you believe that had he known, he would have taken his time and oh. No, maybe I that's why he, he, he was forced to do what he did, yeah. <laughs> which is a good thing. Well, John, look at John, if we go over to, if I do that right now, just turn over to um, uh, First John, one of the little small letters from John, and look at First John 2 verse 18. And my good news Bible actually tempers it down here. It says, my children, the end is near. But literally, it says in the King James, it says in the Greek, it is the last hour. So these people preaching the gospel back in Paul's day, they weren't beating around the bush. They believed that things were going to happen and it happened soon. There seems to be that it is in God's plan that we with our short lives live in expectation mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, whether it be a year or 3,000 years, we are expected to, to operate in the, mm -hmm. with the context of a soon coming Savior. Mm -hmm. well, and in that, only in that is our, is our safety. In a classroom, if you keep the kids under the threat of a pop quiz any week, they tend to keep up with things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, yeah. the angels told Daniel, I, I can't tell you about this thing. I mean, this is for, this is for a different time. Uh, I can't let you know about it. If we go to the book of James, chapter 4, verse 14, it says, You don't even know what your life tomorrow will be. You are like a puff of smoke, which appears for a moment and then disappears. If we stop and be honest with ourselves, wouldn't we have to say that no matter how long we live on this earth, I mean, maybe we live to be 100. Compared to eternity, how long is that? Like a puff of smoke. Well, and you look back at your history, it seems like a puff of smoke will go, I was just a kid, you know? Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> how much of our time do we spend studying for, preparing for this life, working our tails off to, to support ourselves, maybe to keep up with the Joneses, et cetera, and this life, compared to how much time we, spent, we spend preparing for eternity? Well, this I, I think you can dwell on that a little longer. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got the priorities backward. Mm -hmm. But this life actually requires it. Mm -hmm. um, you even just to get bread and uh, clothes, uh, you have to dedicate a lot of time and effort uh, to survival. Uh, think of the people who are farming uh, their own little lots in, an, in another country. I mean, they have to maybe go an hour for water and an hour back, and their life is consumed with this world. When Jesus sent out the disciples of the 70, he said, I sent you out without a purse. I sent you out without any extra clothes. Didn't send any food with you. Did you lack anything? No. And but, they said no. But they depended on the people who were spending time doing those things. Mm -hmm. I understand so, that. Yeah. But nonetheless, that's what God asked them to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm not going to try to advocate that we all have to do that that way, mm -hmm. but it certainly is a, a thrust uh, that challenges our, our sense of values today. Well, as we already have noticed, when Timothy arrived in Athens, and I, I you know, imagine you're, you're arriving in this big city and you're trying to find Paul. How would you find him? I'm crowd. I'd go to the synagogue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably, yeah. And they'd know where he was because he went there first, probably. and after they threw him out, they probably kept track of him. Well, what did Timothy, what did Paul say to Timothy when he, like, first arrived there? We need to go back to Thessalonica and figure out what's going on there. I want you to go. Yeah. And he sent Timothy straight back. Um, Timothy was a very good church worker. Yeah. Paul was terribly worried that things might go badly in Thessalonica. So he was willing to part with Timothy for a period of time just to learn what was going on back there. Notice the words that Paul uses to describe his friend Timothy. Now, the Thessalonians would have known Timothy already pretty well. But these are Paul's words. Finally, we could bear it no, we could not bear it any longer. So we decided to stay on alone in Athens. Well, we sent Timothy, our brother who works with us for God and preaching the good news about Christ. We sent him to strengthen you and help your faith so that none of you should turn back because of these persecutions. You yourselves know that such persecutions are part of God's will for us etc. So Timothy was described as what? Our brother who works with us for God in preaching the good news about Christ. How many of us could qualify as someone like that? A brother, a minister of God, a co-worker in the gospel. Well, having seen Paul perhaps bruised and wounded when he arrived in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians should not have been too surprised that they were suffering persecution. Revelation 13 has some words for us. Look at Revelation 13, starting with verse 14. And it deceived, is talking about the dragon and the false beast, the false prophet. And it deceived all the people living on earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. 
Does that sound at all like what was going on in Thessalonica? The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands, or, I'm sorry, or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark. That is, the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. And? In Thessalonica, were they actually being killed? Presumably. Well, some might say, well, we know what's going to happen. We have prophecies, right? Jesus said to his disciples, John 13, this is the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 19, I tell you this now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. And he repeats that in chapter 14, and repeats it in essentially the same in chapter 16. So what's the purpose of prophecy in 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 our bit larger context here? To prove that the Bible is correct because it has correct prophecy in it. it. Several things have happened already that were predicted. And what Jesus is really saying is, this isn't so you can write tomorrow's newspaper in advance. The real purpose of prophecy addressed to all of us here and our friends listening to us around the world, the real purpose of prophecy is when we see the events predicted in the Bible taking place around us. We know that God is in action, God, that God saw it in advance. He wasn't taken by surprise. He was prepared, and we should be too. Um, I read the Wall Street Journal, and I am so tempted to take a, a, a lineup of all the writers, their editorial staff, uh -huh. and send them a copy of The Great Controversy. And sometimes their editorials, I don't think, uh, they are just writing, and, and yeah. I thought that would be a wonderful project. Mm -hmm. Well, we have been warned many, multiple times about the deceit, trickery, even persecution that is coming in the future. What do you think will happen? Here's a, let's, let's be very practical about this. Do you think the day might come when someone in your church or even your Sabbath school class would be imprisoned because of their beliefs or even killed? We went to the Romanian church and several of those older people had spent a few years in the Romanian prison under Ceausescu or something yeah. like that. Ceausescu. Ceausescu, yes. Yeah. Well, how would that impact your Sabbath activities? Would you be going out to the public park and having a picnic the following Sabbath? Would you lose track of the Sabbath? I hope not. I mean, if you were in prison, could you tell night from day and, and if oh, you... Oh, yeah. Well, if you didn't... bring breakfast around every What if you weren't an orderly person that kept track of the days? Would you lose track of what day was the Sabbath? That'd be the one where they came in and tried to make you go to church. <laughs> Well, would you be hiding in the hills? What would you do if you arrived in Sabbath school class and they said the, the persecution has come here and brother so-and-so has been arrested and killed? I think the hills would be the preferable place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. nice to go camping and, you know, and... Mm -hmm. and it, would you when, put up a big red tent? Well, no, when the... Um, when the Jews were going through the wilderness, their sandals didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out, so we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff, that we would eventually have no clothes. We, maybe our sweats would last forever. The, the, the worst, as I understand it, will come in the cities mm -hmm. where people are crowded together and where, where they're, and, uh, so there would be time to get out of there. There'd be some some benefit to being in a more isolated place. Mm -hmm. Well, when Timothy came back to Paul, what happened? Look at verse six. Now we're looking at First Thessalonians chapter three, starting with verse six. Now Timothy has come back, Paul says, and he has brought us the welcome news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always think well of us and that you want to see us just as much as we want to see you. So in all our trouble and suffering, we have been encouraged about you, brothers and sisters. It was your faith that encouraged us. 
because now we really live if you stand firm in your life in union with the Lord. Now we can give thanks to our God for you. We thank Him for the joy that we have in His presence because of you. Day and night, we ask Him with all our heart to let us see you personally and supply what is needed in your faith. So there was a ringing testimony from Paul when he heard back from Timothy, right? Timothy went and hmm. things were going well. And that cheered Paul, who had been through so much. He needed some cheering, right? Yeah, and, and apparently the Thessalonians were saying, you know, we hope things will quiet down. We're, we would like you to come back. And that, that, wouldn't that always be an encouraging news if you really were friends of somebody and they said, you know, probably not good here right now. Stay away. I mean, how would that make you feel? Well, Paul received a very encouraging news. They wanted to see him again. So what does Paul do? He's praying for them, right? Yes. What's the role of intercessory prayer? So, Paul, <laughs> let's, just, let's just suppose for a moment now that something has happened. Let's say someone is seriously ill. They're even in a coma in a hospital miles away from you. You can't talk to them. You can't do anything for them personally. You can't pay their hospital bill. Well, they wouldn't know about it if you did anyway. And you pray for them. Would it do any good? Yes. Because? If you interceded. <laughs> but the, the name of the prayer is what you're saying. To, you said the, the name, so it implies what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And, but if you believe what you do, and if you believe that your prayer has that, the power, mm -hmm. it, it does. Prayer does amazing things, not just for the one being prayed for, but for you as well. Okay. I've seen people who would not pray. I was in a group one time, and one man said, I'm so sick, I think I have cancer and what have you. And no one would pray for him. I was so sad. No one would really pray for him. Really? Is this a mm -hmm. church group? Yes, and at the end, it bothered me so much. I'm like, what is going on? That's what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, and then uh, someone finally said something that was so, it wasn't even a prayer. It was like, oh, God, if you really want to help him, help him. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was shocked. I was shocked, but, oh, uh, poor guy. <laughs> well, uh, how, how do you think that works? Well, here's the question. Uh, let, let's, those of us who have a, a, a larger view approach to things, we believe in the great controversy, and we think that God is out there in action, and Satan is out there in action. If you pray for, some, for someone, does, God, does that give God better permission to step in and do something? Can he say to the devil, stand back, so-and-so over there is, or maybe the group over there is praying for this, so therefore I can step in, I can do something to help this person because they're asking me to. I'm not, I'm not violating anyone's freedom. They're asking me to do this. Yes. Do our prayers, you, I hope you see the question I'm asking, do our prayers have an impact on the interaction between God and Satan? I hope so. I mean, that's a good question. I, I understand it. Now, do we have some kind of statement or, or something yes, to, to help us out with that. Yes. The whole book of Job. I don't think. Were you going to do Job too? I was thinking about it, but not in that way, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in Zechariah 3. Now, how well, we, have, we, we have a statement that says that prayer is not to work any change in God. Mm -hmm. So if it's not going to work any change in God, how does it work? Well, be, the truth is that, I mean, look at what Jesus, Jesus was praying for the people who were nailing nails to his hands, okay, on the cross. He was praying for them. So God, and we have many statements that God would like everybody to be well. He would like to save everybody. It's, it's not like he, 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 he doesn't want to do those things. We're asking him, in effect, what God is, what we're doing is we're saying, God, you have a right to behave maybe a little differently in the great controversy setting because we're asking you to, to do something and Satan, stand back. 
Satan, 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 God has to constantly keep his, his hands on Satan or Satan would just overrun everything. And I think what we're telling God to do, push him back a little further. Does God do that? Does Satan allow him to, himself to be pushed around? I think, you think it's a numbers game? I, I just no, need, I need no. one more prayer and then I can do no. what I want to do. I don't think it's a numbers game. What, what kind of a game is it then? Well, I can think of several verses. James 5, I believe it's verse 16, says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Yes. From, the, from the King James. Right. So right. I, ha I have to say that I believe that. Yeah, I do too. So I, I think what we're talking about here is, is God says, I think God can say to the devil, stand back, I can do something here because those people are asking me. Because if God says, no, I know you're praying for him, but I can't do anything for that because he's over here and you're over there, he's, he's violating your freedom. So it's a, it's a, it's a give and take. So if, if God is, is operating at the maximum that he can and for good and not violate freedom of mm -hmm. anybody, mm -hmm then would we say that the act of prayer changes somebody so that there is a new condition on earth that he can do something? I think, I think it says to God, okay, I can push this, the devil back a little. Remember, the devil is pushing as hard as he can all the time. Sure, so is God. Yeah. Or he better be. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, th I think he's pushing. I think he has to limit the devil. Right. But, I mean, I, I, I think we have to be careful when we say God is pushing as hard as he could. Del the God could eliminate the devil like that if he, he wanted to push maximally. Not without, fr not without busting oh, but, up freedom. But that's exactly the point. So well, within we're talking the, about his freedom here. Within the context of freedom, he's pushing as hard as he can. Within the context of freedom, he's pushing as hard as he can. But I think our prayer gives him permission to push harder. Okay. What? What is difficult is some prayer seems to get results and other prayer doesn't get results and it really takes stamina to keep praying when you get results sometimes and okay. don't get results and I, I have a promise for you mm -hmm. they they come the day is coming when you will see the great controversy i can absolutely guarantee this from beginning to end in 3d living color in the sky mm -hmm. and you'll see exactly how everything that you did everything that happened to you fits into that total picture. See? Even, a little, you, even a little prayer? Even a little prayer. And you will be able to say at that point, okay, now I know why that happened that way. And why didn't I pray more? And, yeah, yeah probably. probably, exactly. I think the Lord's Prayer, I, I learned it in French. Mm -hmm. And the, the part that says, que ta volonté soit faite soit fait sur la terre comme de les cieux. May your... I can say it verbatim in uh, the way it's okay. put. Yeah. It's, I may believe. Your kingdom come, mm -hmm. may your will be done. The, voila. And, and I taught my son, I said, we, d we have something to do with this. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we went piece by piece by piece saying the prayer. And I wanted to see if he really understood. And I said, if we need to say that, it must mean that when we pray, it get something happen on earth. It gives God, God does something on earth. So if we keep on praying and praying and praying, if everyone was praying, really praying, things would be a lot different. Yeah. 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 Because if you're honest when you pray mm -hmm. and you say, God, may your will be done, we know what his will is. Yep. He wants everyone to be saved. Yes. So if we're praying in accordance with God's will, can he do more? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think... I think there's a literal battle going on between God and Satan, and, and God, you know, Satan mm -hmm. says, you know, look, I've got all these people out here who want things to be my way, and God says, well, I have some people on my side too, and they're praying, and every time we pray, we give God a, an opportunity to, to do a little bit more. But it's praying in God's will. It's not praying, uh, God, I want a uh, new car, new TV, I want... Yeah. Well, unless you really need one. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, you pray that after you pray the Lord's <laughs> Prayer. <laughs> I, I'm thinking I about the, the, the story you, some of you might remember back, and I believe it was the 60s, God's Smuggler, Brother Andrew. Yes, yes. And he ro drove that little Volkswagen that he owned, and finally when he gave it up, his friend took, I mean, his, he took it to a shop or something, they looked at it and said, we don't know how this thing even runs. Mm -hmm. What was he using it for? Okay. Smuggling Bibles in behind the Iron Curtain. Okay, mm -hmm. so God kept it running. God oh. kept it running. Yeah. When you pray, do you feel like you're having a conversation with God? Like you would with a close friend? Or do you think you just have to get out your grocery list and say, God, I need this and this and this and this, and thanks for your time. Bye. Well, that's there's much some, of a relationship. There's some, <laughs> something in between those. <laughs> I mean, having a conversation like Abraham had mm -hmm. or like Moses had, I, I don't know many people that can report that. Mm -hmm. uh, Is that because we're not good enough friends? I don't know. Maybe. Mm -hmm. But uh, how is he supposed to speak to us? Uh, from his word? Mm -hmm. From other people? From impression? Mm -hmm. And also, can you have a conversation with God? Do you have to sit down and be at your specified praying place? Or can you have a conversation with God when you're walking, or oh, when man. you're working, when you're gardening, when you're shopping, when you're... One, one famous theologian whose name I won't mention because it doesn't really matter, but he said, faith, he described faith, he described, well, he just said faith is practicing, even prayer, is practicing the presence of God. God is everywhere. We believe that, right? We take him shopping, we take so, him to the So, yeah, he's store. at the market. He's, a, he's even in the places where we don't think we should go. He, he, otherwise, those people wouldn't be alive. God has to be there to keep them alive. Well, God says... How much, if, how much of that daily, all-the-time prayer do you think you can have and not have the dedicated spot that you engage in? It's a, probably a matter of quality okay yeah, in your designated spot you have better quality prayer well if you have a designated spot of prayer in the morning or devotions maybe you have better quality conversation during the day yeah I, I think that as we study the Bible as we have opportunity to worship and study the Bible yeah. we have a lot more things to talk to God about God I don't you know I Maybe I've got this out of the wrong perspective, but I think, you know, God has a lot more things to say to me than I have to say to him. He already knows everything I have to say to him anyway. You know, and that he's means... He's got all this to say to you. Yeah, he's got all that to say to me, exactly. Bible. So, and more. Paul suggests in, in Thessalonians here that the second coming is, should be a very powerful motivator. It should really impress us. Know, thinking about what the possibility is. Because as in, before that second coming can take place, God is going to bring every single one of our cases into judgment. With every secret thing, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, Revelation 20, 12, and 13, every thought, every motive is going to be taken into, into judgment. Now, often we, we look at that and we say, hmm, that's pretty scary. But it, Matthew 10, 42 tells us that there will be rewards for every good thing we do. So it's not just the bad. And once again, we might remind you that if you would like to, to share in what we're talking about here, or you'd even like to look up these materials uh, in advance of our discussion, uh, they can be found on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G. So, more than that, and this is one of the things I like to think about, the second coming will be a glorious family reunion. And I'm not just talking about father, mother, kids, maybe grandparents. We're talking about all the way back to Adam. And think of how many people are going to have amazing stories to tell us that we don't know anything about yet. 
Well, look at the last two verses, last three verses in our discussion for today. May our Lord, and I'm starting from verse 11, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11. May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus prepare the way for us to come to you. Paul says, I'm praying to be able to come back to you. May the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow more and more and become as great as our love for you. And this way he will strengthen you and you will be perfect and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all who belong to him. Pretty impressive kind of thinking, isn't it? Was Paul able to return to Thessalonica? Yes, he did on several occasions after that, yes. Well, there's a famous verse that we've talked about before. Let's just mention it briefly. John 13, 35 says these words. I'm reading from my Good News Bible once again. If you have love, that's agape love, for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Could it be that that kind of selfless love would make us stick out like sore thumbs, thumbs just because it's so different than the behavior of the rest of the world? Do, well, so selfless love should even be in our business dealings. Mm -hmm. Bankers, business people yeah. should be having selfless love. Ellen White describes it like this, true heaven-born love is not selfish and changeable. It is not dependent on human praise. The heart of him who receives the grace of God overflows with love for God and for those for whom Christ died. Self is not struggling for recognition. He does not love others because they love and please him, because they appreciate his merits or because they are Christ's purchased possession. If his motives words and actions are misunderstood or misrepresented, he takes no offense, but pursues the even tenor of his way. He is kind, thoughtful, and humble in his opinion of himself. Norm, that's what you were talking about earlier. Yet full of hope, always trusting in the mercy and love of God. Ellen White, Christ's Object Lessons, pages 101 and 102. Have you ever seen, have you often seen that kind of love manifested in your own cell life? or in the lives of other Christians you know? Well, um, we, Bill Gates is taking a lot of his fortune and working in Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, I find that a marvel. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's an inspiration. Yeah. There's an interesting phrase at the very end of verse 13 that we should took out, take a look at briefly. When our Lord Jesus comes with all who belong to him. Does that mean that the saints are in heaven waiting to come back and they'll come back with Jesus when he comes? Well, how could we be resurrected and be coming back at the same time? The presence of God our Father when our Master Jesus arrives with all his followers. That could be the entire universe. Yeah. Well, look at a few verses real, real quickly. We're running out of time. Matthew 24, 30 and 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the peoples of earth will weep as they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The great trumpet will sound, and he will send out his angels to the four corners of the earth, and they will gather his chosen people from one end of the world to the other. What does that sound like he's coming with? Sounds like angels. he's coming with angels. Look at Mark 8, verse 38. If a person is ashamed of me and of my teaching in this godless and wicked day, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Does that give us a clue? And what about Mark 13, 27? He will send the angels out to the four corners of the earth to gather God's chosen people from one end of the world to the other. Revelation says there'll be silence in heaven for, mm. what is it, half an hour? Yeah. Well, it's likely that Paul was thinking about Zechariah 14, uh, verse 5, when he said what he did. You will escape through this valley that divides the mountain in two, in two. You will flee as your ancestors did when the earthquake struck in the times of King Uzziah of Judah. The Lord my God will come bringing all the angels with him why it's silent up there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bringing all the angels with him. Angels. So probably Paul isn't talking about him. These holy ones he talks about here is, is a reference to angels and not necessarily yeah. to other saints. Right. 
So when he brings these angels with him, <clears throat> do the angels go and then go and resurrect the people, each angel, one person, two angels to a person? Ellen White <laughs> says, we're going to look up and the entire sky is going to be lit up with brilliant angels. Try to imagine what that'll look like. Well, in conclusion, what role should thinking about our eternal home in heaven play in our day-to-day -day thinking and activities? Christians have sometimes been accused of focusing on pie in the sky by and by, so heavenly-minded that there have no earthly good. You've heard those expressions. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Should we constantly live our lives in, 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 in light of the eternal? Well, the first church in Jerusalem functioned almost like a commune. They ate together, they spent their time together, they witnessed together. Might that kind of community be a part of the final church at the end of this history? Are we building that kind of relationship with fellow Christians, church members that might prepare us for that? We're having potluck. Good, yeah. <laughs> Well, there have been lots of experiments done that prove that human beings need love. They need attention and love from other human beings. We need, as church members, we need to be putting our, our spiritual arms around everyone in our Sabbath school class, everyone in our church, and, and saying, you know, you're a, I'm a part of you and you're a part of me. We are together. Here in the Western, civil, Western civilizations, uh, we don't see people with demon possession, at least not that we recognize. Why do you think that is? Surely we don't believe that the devil has gone on vacation. So what's he doing? What's he up to at this point? Well, we're running out of time, so we can't say. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good excuse. <laughs> Paul was so concerned about the Thessalonians that he was willing to send Timothy back there despite having to stay in Athens by himself. There were three main things that he wanted Timothy to accomplish. Most of all, he wanted to affirm and confirm the faith of the Thessalonians. He wanted to encourage them, to remind them about what they'd done together, and he was very anxious to find out how they were doing in his absence. Satan is directly involved, I believe, in our day in what we call the pre-advent judgment. He is trying to accuse every one of us. Read Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. And he's busy with that, but he's also busy tempting us. But we must not give in to that kind of pressure. See you next week.